On August 9, 1969, Charles Manson led a group of brainwashed hippies into the home of Sharon Tate, killing her and four others at her home in Los Angeles. I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing for her. The scene at her house in Benedict Canyon was pretty messed up. Not only was Tate pregnant, Manson and his band used her blood to write the word pig on the front door. Nothing could have been more horrendous than what happened that night. But you already know that. If these weren't already the most famous murders in U.S. history, Tarantino cemented their mythical status. No, I was dumber than that. Something like Rex. Cut on Tex. Tex. <laughs> what you don't know is that Manson wasn't who you thought he was. In fact, he might have been a CIA construct. Before you accuse me of lunacy, listen to these three facts. Number one. Spawn Ranch, where the Manson family lived, was under surveillance months before the Tate murders. If the police knew they were plotting the murders, why didn't they stop them? Number two, there was a mysterious guy named Reeve Whitson who would constantly hang around Sharon Tate's house. A lot of Whitson's family and friends admitted that he was probably CIA. The morning after the Tate murders, Whitson was at Tate's house before the police arrived, implying he was either keeping the house under surveillance or somehow had inside knowledge of the murders. Number three, this is where we get crazy. Manson committed a lot of petty crimes in the 60s, but whenever he got caught and thrown in jail, his parole officer, a guy named Roger Smith, negotiated his release. Beyond his legal prowess, Smith was an expert in LSD, amphetamines, and their effect on violence. Manson and Smith were bizarrely close. I've never seen any parolee, parole officer relationship like that. In fact, Manson affectionately called Smith Jewball the doctor and lawyer from Manson's favorite book, the 1961 sci-fi thriller Stranger in a Strange Land by Robert Heinlein. It was his de facto Bible. In fact, that's where the Manson family got their ritual water sharing ceremonies. Manson even named his son after the main character in the book, Valentine Michael Smith. There's one problem. Manson was basically illiterate. How would a book like this have had such a profound effect on him if he couldn't read it? Well, maybe it was read to him while he was on LSD. The police used to watch over the people. Now they're watching the people. Okay, that's enough of a cliffhanger. If you follow this channel, you're probably wondering why Charles Manson is the center of this week's episode of American Alchemy. I don't know. Well, he's actually not. Journalist and author Tom O'Neill is. His best-selling book, Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s, throws the conventional Manson narrative completely on its head. And they're running in the streets! Helter Skelter, the true story. And it's a great example of journalism of a bygone era. You know, the journalism where you work your ass off on a real story over a long time horizon and risk your reputation for the sake of the American public knowing the truth? O'Neill tears apart the conventional narrative that Charles Manson was simply a crazy cult leader listening to secret encoded messages by the Beatles. This was the theory set forth by Vincent Bugliosi in his best-selling book, Helter Skelter. A book that shouldn't really have been taken seriously, or at least as unbiased, because Bugliosi was the lead prosecutor of the case against Manson. After 20 years of painstaking journalism, O'Neill presents a far more solid alternative. In short, it involves the CIA, their top secret mind control program called MKUltra, and the government's long-standing aim to destroy the hippie movement. Because it won't be here long, you motherfuckers. Without further ado, let's talk to this week's American alchemist, Tom O'Neill. Different parts of the brain have different activities. <laughs> but you know that, don't you? Maybe you should interview me. The time keeps on flying. I decided to go with Tom to Spawn Ranch, an old western movie set in Chatsworth where the Mansons lived and plotted a lot of their murders. There's a picture of the Manson family that was in Life magazine of a group of them after Charlie and the others were in prison. This is where Manson used to gather the girls to sing. What was that song you were just hearing? It was actually a young Charles Manson. At one point, Manson was just an average five foot seven scraggly haired guy trying to make it in the music business like everyone else in LA. For a while, he even lived with Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. I was curious about how Manson became Manson. You know, how he went from a very barely literate con who spent half of his life institutionalized and in under a year had become this hippie guru leader who had complete control over, by 69, as many as 30 or 40 people who would do whatever he told them to do. 
including kill absolute strangers and have no remorse for it after the fact. So how did Charles Manson go from petty criminal and aspiring musician to mastermind murderous manipulator whose followers believe that he was both Jesus and the devil at the same time. You know what you are as I know what I am. Ironically, this dark transformation all began in the summer of love, 1967 in Haight-Ashbury of San Francisco. At that time, there was a guy named David Smith that ran the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic. The clinic would see any sort of walk-ins off the street if they needed medical attention. He anticipated correctly that there would be this invasion of kids who were coming for what became known as the Summer of Love. Charles Manson was actually a frequent visitor. And David Smith publicly said, we're not doing anything, any research or anything like that. We're just providing medical care, nothing more. But the medical help came with a little catch. Enter one Dr. Jolly West a renowned psychiatrist who later served as the chair of UCLA's psychiatry department, but we now know was deeply involved in the CIA's brainwashing program, MKUltra. MKUltra began in the early 50s around the Korean War, and it involved giving people LSD to brainwash them and cause them to kill on command. Despite all of the program's records being destroyed, we now know because of correspondence between Jolly West and the CIA's Sidney Gottlieb that Jolly was top brass at MKUltra. What's even crazier is that Jolly West was actually Jack Ruby's psychiatrist. In case you're a little foggy on American history, Jack Ruby was the guy that shot and killed the supposed lone gunman of JFK, Lee Harvey Oswald. But Ruby had no violence in his past. I never used the term angry, that's not in my vocabulary. Didn't know where he was when he was killing Lee Harvey Oswald. If you're in one of these fugue or one of these psychomotor epileptic states, you're unknowledgeable of what you do, then there can't be capital punishment. Jack Ruby didn't remember actually killing Lee Harvey Oswald. He sort of blacked out. Right after he shot Oswald a couple times, he said, how did I get here? Why are you doing this to me? I'm Jack Ruby. This is exactly what West, in his earliest letters to Gottlieb, said he was going to accomplish for them to induce mental illness in a person without without their knowledge. Just months into Ruby's prison sentence, Jolly West goes in to treat him for a few hours with no cameras present. West comes out of that session saying that Ruby has had a psychotic break. And from that point forward, Ruby was not psychologically stable. Did West and the CIA want to silence him? For more on that, you might have to watch an Oliver Stone documentary. But the point is, it is very clear that Jolly West was implicated in MKUltra. Now back to Charles Manson, Jolly West was using the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, the one that Manson went to, as a recruiting pool to find hippies, dose them up with LSD, and do all sorts of crazy stuff with them. This is now a declassified CIA program that was called Operation Midnight Climax. He studied people at our clinic. So our clinic was when they came in and people from our clinic. In other words, in a certain sense, he recruited subjects from our clinic. Charles Manson was more than likely one of these unwitting test subjects. In 1967 is exactly when he transformed from random petty con man to cult leader sex god with what seems to be intense mind control over a band of followers. But why would the CIA brainwash Charles Manson and turn him into a cult leader that would kill one of America's darling actresses in Sharon Tate? That makes no sense. What was the motivation? Hoover especially and Reagan believed that the youth movement was funded by communist Russia and China. Communist indoctrination, communist subversion. It's no secret that the government was deeply threatened by the hippie movement and wanted to marginalize it at all costs. In fact, there were programs run out of the FBI and CIA called COINTELPRO and CHAOS, which basically tracked dissident members of the hippie and free love movements. So when Manson was identified on December 1st of 69, the media had pictures of, you know, guys with long hair and beards and buckskin jackets and women with long hair and no makeup, breastfeeding infants who were accused of killing a bunch of people for no reason at all, except that they were all burnt out on acid and would listen to anyone who told them what to do. I never had a long hair before I got busted. I never had a beard before I got busted. I went to shave and the guy said, no, you can't shave. Let me get a haircut. He said, no, we don't want you to change your appearance. So when a bunch of long-haired hippies suddenly turned into cold-blooded killers, the free love movement lost a ton of charisma. And that's why you have the author Joan Didion saying, August 9th, 1969 was the day the 60s abruptly ended. 
Was Charles Manson an MK Ultra patient? Tom O'Neill admits there's no smoking gun. Honestly, I'm not quite sure myself, but it's very obvious that the conventional narrative that we've been spoon fed is completely off. What do you think about all this? Leave a comment with your craziest conspiracy theory, hit the like, subscribe, the bell for notifications, and tune in next time. My name is Jesse Michaels, and this is American Alchemy.